All right. Good evening. Hey, it's Mark coming to you from Baker's Green Acres. Uh, I guess I'm a couple minutes late, and I'm sorry about that. I was doing something here. I was really getting into what I was doing, and I uh, wasn't watching the clock. But all is well now, and we are ready to go. Um, <clears throat> Jill's here at the laptop, and uh, I guess we're going to stay with that position for now. Um, Okay, I got confirmation this week. So uh, I am going to be speaking at the Rogue Food Conference that's going to be down in Cincinnati, Ohio at the Marriott uh, Hotel, the Marriott? Marriott Hotel, I guess. And that is at the airport. <clears throat> uh, I guess it's a pretty swank place, you know, Cincinnati and all. Um, I don't know if they have a pool yet, but I think just be on safe side, bring your bikinis anyway. I know we will. Uh, I'm gonna be staying there Friday and Saturday night. Uh, Rogue Food Conference, in a nutshell, <clears throat> I think it's a little misleading because it almost seems as though we're gonna talk about how to be rogue. Well, that really isn't it. It's how to operate a small farm operation in a rogue environment. That's really what it's about. And there's plenty of people that do it. And now is the time uh, to draw the line in the sand and bring these folks together and start to let this congeal a little bit and be able to spread the information out. That's, that's my understanding of what this is about. So uh, the main guy is a guy by the name of Joel Salatin. And uh, he's worth looking up on YouTube. Um, it's worth finding out. He's written, I think, 12 books. I know at least 10. Uh, I will have a copy of the first one that I've, I ever got, and it was called Posture, uh, Pastured Poultry Profits. All right. And my book book now, the, the binding's gone on it, and it's, uh, it's pretty beat up because I've gone through it quite a few times. And I guess I've had it about 15 years now. So that was my first uh, introduction to him. <clears throat> and then the year after I got the book, I heard him speak at a small farms conference up here in uh, northern Michigan. He hasn't been back since, as far as I know, because <clears throat> it was about that time that the uh, small farms conference was taken over by the extension service. And they found him to be a little radical. They thought it was a little radical. And back in those days, I was kind of in on the, uh, the inside poop. And uh, anyway, I didn't think he was radical. At the time I heard him, I was about ready to go one way or another. Uh, when I first moved here, <clears throat> I was approached by um, industrial agriculture to put in hog houses on my property and boy they had a good pitch sounded great <clears throat> um i look back on that and uh, it's a great example of uh for me anyway in this house to listen to my wife because she, she didn't like the idea of it you know we we're going to put two of those great big hog houses in on the back 40 and at the time i had heard that uh you know, very, very loosely that you can make about 70,000 a year with two of them going. <clears throat> but that's after you get the loans paid off and everything else. And uh, I'm so glad it didn't happen. And uh, really, I, I owe him, Joel Salatin, a debt of gratitude because picking up his book and reading between the lines, you get the feel for what industrial agriculture is all about. <clears throat> and uh, it's definitely not for the rugged individualist for sure it's not and so we went the way that we went and the rest is history and i'm so glad that i don't have a million dollars worth of buildings and equipment sitting down there that somebody could hold over my head if i didn't do what they wanted me to do it's a <clears throat> very interesting story i would tell sometime um if we don't if we run out of things to talk about um but if you go to this conference, last I heard, there was 30 tickets left, okay? 
and there's a group coming from here now that uh, that we've put it out on our on our feed, and uh, that's great. So I'll get to meet some of the people from around here. Uh, my understanding is <clears throat> we're going to be opening at 7.30, is it? 7.30 to 8.30, 9.30, 30, yeah. For what? You mean 8 in the 30, morning? 30, 9.30, yeah. 7.30 to 8.30, that's going to be... And and that's where we, we get to hear from Joel. Um, and I think it should be enlightening. Okay. And they're going to serve us breakfast. And then 8.30 really to 9.30, there's the first speaker. We don't know her. Uh, but she's, from what I've read so far, she's got an interesting take on this and has started what she calls a food church. So somehow that's exempt from uh, the food Nazis. And then I'm going 9.30 to 10.30. And uh, I plan on... <clears throat> talking a little bit about where we've came from, um, the struggles that we had, and where we are now and how we got here. So I'm really interested in solutions to this, and I think that's what we want to pass on. I, I'm not really interested in just hearing people complain about what a bunch of jerks the people from the state are, because I've come to the point where I realized that... Uh, uh, they work for a company and that is what the company wants them to do. All right. But we don't necessarily need to have their rule book in our back pocket. We have options. All right. So I'm going to, I'm not, I don't want to spoil the surprise. I'll just leave it right there. <clears throat> Let's see what else I was going to talk about. Um, I went up to, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, last Thursday, and our mission was to process a pig uh, at the Shady Grove farm and get that ready for an event on Saturday night. As you know, my friend Randy has had some problems with his heart and they did a um, an initial procedure and then they had to go in and redo it. And the second time they had to do open heart. So they split him open, pulled him apart, and uh, was it six weeks? Yeah. When we got there, he had to come down on, off the roof of his house to greet us. All right. So uh, we were not real happy hearing that he was uh, putting an addition on his house after open heart surgery after six weeks. But when we saw him and we saw the way he was moving and his color and all that stuff, uh, he's not the average bear. So uh, again, I listened to my wife. She was a little upset on our drive up there about what he was doing. But after she saw him, she was less upset about the way he was progressing. You know, he's progressing a little, little faster than we, than we kind of thought. But he looked good. At, at times, I forgot that he was uh, recovering from open heart surgery. I, I actually forgot, you know. Oh, I need a hose. So, hey, just go grab it and, you know, hand it to me. <clears throat> so... Uh, the, uh, the event was good. It was in uh, Marquette, a lot of real interesting people there. We had a great time and we came home uh, the next day. We traveled south for a few hours that night and stopped and then came home the next day. And uh, it's been really nice around here, very warm. We still have very little snow on the ground and here it is January, so. Maybe this is just going to be a, a super easy winter for us. That's fine. Okay, so let's talk tonight about where we're going this spring and some of the things that, that people want to get started on, all right? And then the conversation that we need to have, Jill and I, is how we want to proceed from here. So in the past, we've, <clears throat> we still do, we do classes here at the farm. But now that we have this Zoom channel and our phones and cameras and stuff like that, what we're proposing is coming up with, let's say, a subject that, that we feel as though we've 
done enough and feel qualified to talk about say like pastured poultry, which I learned from Joel Salatin. We could break it up into say four classes, five classes, and we could do it online, but it would be specific to that function, pastured poultry. So we'd start off with equipment, operation, brooding, let's say, um, processing, maybe marketing, maybe some five. And we could break it up like that. So it'd be say uh, an hour per session. So, or an hour and a half, kind of like we do here. <clears throat> but when you would come to that, it would be a pay to come, but your face would be on my screen and my face would be on your screen. And, um, you know, there would be maybe 10 people and we can converse very quickly without you having to type anything. So that's, that's the uh, general idea, but Jill and I really need to talk about it and get some stuff down on paper. But for now, if you could fire me some subjects that we could uh, that we could you know ponder and I, I think having done this as long as I have I could put together pretty quickly in my mind just a, a synopsis of what what we would want to hit and uh, that's kind of <clears throat> that's kind of what you do is I I would if, if my if I am invested in your success I am going to give you the the items that you need to master first and let you fill in um, fill in the blanks in between the, the major, major things where you you can have big problems in, in any of these operations. So that's what we're thinking. Um, tonight, questions, uh, please put them in all caps. And um, we did a random pull of subjects. We have a, a deck of subjects that we pull. And tonight, the only things that are off limits are polygamy and cannibalism. Everything else uh, we're fine to talk about. So tonight, polygamy and cannibalism. And that's off limits tonight. We're not going to talk about anything having to do with that. So with that, I will take the first question. No questions? We have no questions. Okay, well. Well, I did have a question today. Joe Brown called me today. Um, he's a guy that I'm mentoring out in Maine, and he's decided to take up Mangalitsa. And he called me because um, some guys that live around him have told him that how do you expect to get good pork if you're feeding your animals garbage? Because he's he's followed my my suggestion that instead of going to the feed mill and buying feed, see if you can find something else that you can get cheaper or for free. And so he's done that, and he's he's procuring, uh, you know, um, table scraps I think from a restaurant which if you looked at it in a can, you would say that is garbage. So how can you get good pork from a pig if you feed it garbage? Just think that through a little bit. Um, you know, you're, you're preparing vegetables at a restaurant, all the pieces that you can't feed to the people go in a bucket, but they're still fresh and they're just not human grade and why is stuff not human grade it's because we're finicky especially americans we're finicky um so i think that's where the answer is you know if you're feeding spent grains right when we um we brew uh alcohol we don't use the the part of the grain that's spent we're just taking the juice out of it and some of the I have the sugars and the carb carbohydrates out of it. And then the, the hulls and the husks are left over, but they still have a lot of nutrition in them. Um, you know, you'll, you can still get a, a really good carcass doing that. I, I, uh, Joe, if you're listening, I recommend that you head down to the coast and bring up a bunch of seaweed because we did that. We brought seaweed from Maine and fed it to our pigs here and they, they did really well on it. So, okay, 
Are there any other questions that came in? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Joshua had one for me. For Jill. Okay, yeah. you want to get in here? Let me just turn it to you. Maybe I'll just be taking a night off here. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, what was the question? You want me to read it to you? Um, yeah, Joshua, you wanted to know thoughts on ashwagandha whole plant extract? I use, up. oh yeah, I use ashwagandha quite a bit in, I had a powder extract, but ashwagandha is just one of those fabulous adaptogenic herbs that helps you balance your nervous system. So it's very calming in a very natural way that you won't get side effects from or anything else. It's a fabulous herb. Go for it. 100%. What do you take it for? Um, things that I uh, think nervous system kind of issues like nervousness, anxiety, a lot of worry, stressed out. Do they, does it grow around here? I've never heard of it growing around here. I don't, I think it's something, I'm not sure where it comes from. That would be an interesting thing to look up. I don't okay. know. What is he thinking he needs it for? Is he saying? He didn't say. Okay. Well. Nope. Are you, yeah, let us know, Joshua, if you're using it. What are you it taking it for? Or, yeah. Or what were you going to use it for? Because um, I know I've seen it as an extract. I got it online in a powder form. And then I added it. Ooh, I have a recipe on my website for hot chocolate. So I make how homemade hot chocolate with just cocoa and water and milk and maple syrup and I would put ashwagandha powder in that and so you get the benefits of the ashwagandha it's calming and relaxing and it gives it kind of a malty taste like a chocolate hot chocolate malted milk it's really good so mm -hmm. ashwagandha go for it why don't you give your website oh it's AbundantLivingSolutions.com, and it's in the blog. I believe it's the top one. It's a blog of recipes from one of my talks, So, but it's in there, AbundantLivingSolutions.com. Cool. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> I think that uh, what I am... Uh, what I am looking for these days, if I have to tune into something, uh, I am getting to the point in my life where I really want to hear solutions. And <clears throat> what I mean by that is when I, uh, like I, when I need to find someplace and I stop along the side of the road and I say to somebody, do you know where this is? I am asking them for the solution to get where I need to go. And as soon as I get a, well, I don't know, but maybe it's, you know, it's like, I, no, I don't want that. I want solutions. Okay. So as, as I progress in my, the direction that I'm going, I want to be able to provide solutions more than philosophy. So more solutions than philosophy. All right. It's tough. But, you know, that's the direction that I'd like to go. So Jill put solutions on her website, and I think that's good. When I had to come up with a, um, a subject line or a title for the talk that I was going to give, I definitely wanted solutions in that. And so that's a little backstory on that. All right. Are there any more questions? Oh yeah. I saw I saw one in there that yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Laura wants to know what kind is the new boar. The new boar. <laughs> and Robert wants to know if it has a straight tail or curly tail. Yeah. He's a wise guy. <laughs> Thank the you. new boar. All right, the new boar, his name is Marty. I'm not sure if I went over this with you guys last week. Yeah, because she asked the same question last week. Oh, right. That's why it <laughs> sounds familiar. Is this Laura Greenbean? Yes. Uh, the new boar 
Okay, I just want to clarify this. I, it's right now. It is. It's an industrial secret, and I am bound to secrecy. And no, uh, the board did not come from George Soros, and it did not come from Elon Musk. All right, it did not. I, I promise you that. But it did come from you know a source, and it's supposed to be like way hotter than Mangalitsa. Now that's tough. That's tough. When I did this this pig uh, last Thursday, um, it was a Berkshire Yorkshire cross. All right, so kind of a regular farm pig. It looked nice, broad in the shoulders and all that stuff, but it just wasn't a Mangalitsa. When we opened it up, it smelled like a pig. You know, it just smelled. Um, they their personality is kind of weird. And then when we were breaking down the carcass, we had to break it down warm, which normally we don't do that. Normally we'll wait till the next day, but we had to get it cooked. Um, the meat looked like chicken and it pulled apart. There was no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There was no constitution to the meat. It wasn't, Text it wasn't, you know, I don't know. Mangalitsa meat is more like beef. It really is tough when it's raw. And this wasn't. Uh, the muscle groups separated on their own. I'd never seen that. Um, and it just, it, it just reminded me, you know, I'm not slamming this pig. I mean, it ate very well. They made pulled, pulled pork out of it that night. And I, I understand it was good. Uh, but a funny thing happened. We stayed at a hotel, which is always kind of a, bittersweet thing because we don't have a TV here. So it's kind of neat to watch TV. But after about 15 minutes of it, you've seen every commercial ever made. And it was just, but anyway, we were watching the show, Alaska State Troopers, and some girl went off of a four wheeler onto a guardrail. And then they showed a bunch of her meat on there after it was over and looked just like that pig meat. So I was grossed out by it. I don't usually get grossed out by things, but no, the Mangalitsa is is uh, really, really different than uh, standard pigs. Um, but this pig, this new pig, my new boar, is supposed to be above that. Now, we'll have to see because we got to let him breed these sows first and then, you know, raise their babies up to butchering weight. So it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while and you know maybe at some point i'll let the breed out when we have about a year ahead of everybody else but i don't want everybody else heading over to bleep country and getting these pigs while they can you know not george soros not elon musk next question <laughs> but he is getting along fine he's he's looking pretty good uh, this is a question from Brittany. Why is ham cured? Why is it never sold just plain or uncured? She had a customer that asked her and she didn't have a good answer. Her husband says it's because it's more valuable cured. Hmm. They have to do more well, with history. Or... Um, yeah, I got to back up a little bit on that, but I think it's worth knowing. Any of the processes that we go through uh, making ham is a process that falls under the umbrella of charcuterie. Some people pronounce it charcuterie, right? But it's charcuterie. And these processes are processes where we cure the ham meat in order to stabilize it. So uh, let's say you kill a pig in the fall. Um, there's way too much there for you to eat that night. And you can eat as much as you can, but by a couple, three weeks, it's going to start getting bad, you know. And so we use uh, a curing process to stabilize the meat. In a nutshell, that's what it is. So one of the big items that you use is salt. And, and uh, now what's happened in the last few years is people have, they've realized that, hey, this, these, 
cured products. They are really neat looking and they eat really well and uh, people will pay more for them than just a fresh ham, right? So there's two kinds of hams. There's a cured ham and then there's a fresh ham. A fresh ham would be uh, sort of like the hams that we used the other night up in the UP. Uh, they were killed one day, cooked the next. So it never did get cured because there was no reason to do it. We could we could stick it outside and it was cold enough outside to where it was not gonna it was not gonna rot. And uh, you know the in in homesteading especially small farming too. Uh, we uh, like to preach that there's a season for everything. So if I process a pig in the fall, it's cool enough out where the flies are gone. You know, they're gone for the season. If I did it in July and it sat there for 10 minutes, flies would be on it and laying eggs. They, they're real good at it real quick. And then by the next day you would have maggots you know so that's why we use the season All right now um call it uh factory farming or commercial farming i think factory farming is more appropriate but they'll kill pigs around the calendar you know they actually kill pigs around the clock at some of these huge uh, slaughterhouses and so they have to run refrigeration refrigeration requires uh, it can be done, but it requires a whole lot more infrastructure to make that happen. So then you need a building, you know, you see where it's going. Um, if you kill in the fall as a homesteader, you can do it under a shade tree. You know, you can just pull that pig up in there. It's, you know, kill it one day, the next day, the carcass is set up. What I mean by that, it's, it's, it's not mortified, it's just... Um, gets a little bit more rigid. So when you're cutting it, it's not like cutting a, uh, a seal, you know, like trying to find your way through the blubber on it. If you wait till the next day, all the lines become very clear and you can get your knife in between them and you can break that pig down with just about a knife. Um, maybe a little bit of saw work, um, but it could be a, a handsaw, right? Um, yeah, it's a season for everything, and if you want a fresh ham, it might be pretty hard to find it because people, when they think of a ham, they think of pink, they think of you know like a Hormel ham or a, um, the other ones, and they're kind of salty and they're kind of now. The way we do it is we will use nothing but uh, sea salt. But the way they do it, they use a very high nitrate brine. And uh, the way we would do it, we would just take that rear leg and we'd put some salt on the bone and then pack it in salt every couple of days, upset it and turn it until the weight of it was reduced, you know, the proper uh, percentage. And then it can be hung up. And at that point, it, the, the curing process begins. Then you need a certain temperatures to do that. And in most places, I don't know if this would work down in Florida, Mike. Uh, it might, though. You know, I mean, you'd probably have to research it, what they did in the past with their hogs. Um, the temperature is about right up here. I mean, because curing happens at about 60 degrees, 60 percent humidity. But there, there again, if you don't want to do that, if you want to eat it the next day or a couple of weeks, you could just freeze it. Or up here, it's cold enough outside that it would just it would keep. It might not freeze solid, but it would be um, it would be down low enough where the bacterial action would be slowed down. Where, for all intents and purposes, it would be uh, shelf stable. So there you go. That's what curing is. Now smoking is a different story. Uh, smoking came along because. Back in the day, I mean, sometimes you do have to kill in the summertime. If you want to eat, you have to kill in the summertime. And then you would have a smokehouse and you would hang your, your meats in there. 
and get a smudgy fire going, you know, something that's not really burning very good. And keep putting, you know, wet wood on it. And um, you'd want the smoke to be cold. You wouldn't want like a barbecue. You don't want it hot, hot. And that smoke coming up through the, through the meat would keep the flies off of it. And then it would put a smoke covering, you know, smoke when you see it, that's actually particulates in the air, very small, but that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a whole bunch of particulates. They would cover those pieces of meat and that smoke would keep the flies away. They, they don't want to touch it. So that's where smoking came in, but smoking and curing two different things. I hope that's clear. There's really good books out there. Uh, one that we is our go to is charcuterie. That's what it's called by Brian Polson and Michael Ruhlman. And I have actually met Brian Polson um, several years ago. When we first got these pigs on the farm, he uh, he's a private pilot too. He flew up here just to see the pigs. So yeah, I've actually met him. And then we got his book and, you know, Rest his history. He's actually been here to kill pigs with us a long time ago. I haven't seen him in years, but is there another question? Oh yeah. Um, Lone Star wondered if Lone you Star. could redo your farm, what layout would you change? Huh? Or redo your farm layout. What would you yeah. change? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was talking about Salatin a little while ago and Throughout his instructional books, he uh, he talks about the the uselessness of permanent structures. <clears throat> so you could put a bunch of money. You can put seventy thousand dollars into a pole barn, you know, and that's where you're going to keep your equipment and keep your hay, or you could spend $7,000 on a clear span building that would have a 20 year life on the fabric. <coughs> and then if you get tired of farming, you can just scrap it or sell it to somebody and, and then it's gone. And then your farm is kind of like a clear slate for the next guy. <coughs> uh, in my case, the, the, uh, the barn was here. And the barn actually was falling down on this place. And that's one of the reasons now, there was a lot of things falling down on this place, but <clears throat> it was sort of a, um, a liability on the price tag of this place. And we felt strongly about keeping it because it was, it was, uh, there was so much character in it. So we spent a lot of money <clears throat> the first year to fix it up and put steel on the side and, I'm glad we did it now, but um, I think that I would pay more attention to fertility um, and water, uh, keeping water on your farm or water distribution. I think those are the things that I would really look at. So, um, but see, like your place is different than mine. Um, you may have something that's higher on the priority list. Let's say you have quicksand on your place, like on Gilligan's Island. I'd get that taken care of first. You know, I don't have quicksand, so it's not a problem. Out in Montana, uh, where we first started, the soil out there was Montana gumbo, they called it. And it was the weirdest stuff. You'd just put your toe in it and you'd come out with a glob this big. So the fix on that was <clears throat> getting more organic material into the, into the ground. And so there was a, a lot of ways to do that, but I didn't even know back then. Um, and, and this all, this also comes from Joel Salatin. He gives several uh, examples of this in the book. There's a, there's a book that he put, that he put out called you can farm, not to be confused with anyone can farm. That's our program. Anyone can farm. Ours came from the movie Ratatouille. His, I don't know where he got that uh, that title, but in You Can Farm, he talks about building fertility 
in the farm that he has right now. And he said he became a collector of carbon-based materials. So when I heard that, I thought, wow, it's, I never thought of that. And the first thing that came my way was we have an Amish neighbor and uh, he saw that I had a dump truck and he says, uh, could I hire you? Or maybe he didn't say, could I hire you? Or he said, could you move some of this, some of the newer for me? Because he, it was building up fast and he didn't know what to do with it. <clears throat> and he had heard, you know, all these horror stories about the DEQ and all this, right? So I said, oh yeah, I can take that. So I spent, I think a week hauling manure out of his barns here. So uh, they use their machine to load it. And my truck will haul like 12 yards. It's a 10 yard dump. But if I really uh, fill it up, it'll hold about 12. Yards. And I'd bring it back and dump it in a row, windrow. And then I dump another one real close and push them together. And I left them like that all winter. I built three of them like 300 feet long. So I hauled a lot of manure. And then I started hauling sawdust that I could get for nothing. I started hauling um leaves i started hauling wood chips and then i started getting wood chips hauled here they would be glad to do it and we started making biochar we started uh composting quite a bit so we really spent a lot of time doing that but in the process of doing that i mean you're laying out money and nothing's coming back but i had fields here i have probably about 20 acres total that were so bad that you didn't even bother going over them with a, with a hay bind. If it was a dry summer, there was nothing. They were like a burned up old baseball field is what they remind me of. Uh, now they produce uh, first cutting. I get probably 24 bales of hay off this top, I think, or 22. And then I actually, I can cut it again. Um, so that equals dollars. So, but we had to put quite a bit in, but investing in fertility pays you out, but it pays you out much, much later and it will pay you out much longer too. So I think that's what I would invest in, uh, possibly there's a bunch of stuff. I think you do well to have somebody look at it. If you don't have the experience to figure out how to prioritize stuff, um, Yeah, and then build a plan. Uh, spend some time building a plan. The plan can change, but at least if you have a direction and maybe a coach, maybe take into consideration, like I don't even know how old you are, um, you know, how many years you're going to be able to dedicate to it. If you're 80 now, um, you're going to want to see a payout on it a little quicker. You know, and I, you, I, I'm getting the feeling that a payout for you is just going to be in, in intrigue and process and all those things. That is really where it's at. I tell you, I'm going to be 60 in April. And I'm just at the point where it's like a new plateau where I think I've been through that phase, that 10 or 12 year phase where it's like money. I got to get as much money as I can and missing life, you know, basically missing life, you know, certain processes around here that I really like. I didn't have time to embrace those processes because I had to get to the next thing because plowing the driveway is good, good and fun and everything. And listen to Creedon's clear auto revival is good, but I got to get this done so I can get that done. And that was then. I'm not saying I was in the wrong. I'm just saying that now is a time when, when I'm going to plow, I'm going to clean the windshield off first. I'm going to make sure the truck is nice and warm. I may even take a cup of coffee out there with me. And I got this really neat little speaker for Christmas. It's got a magnet on it. I can stick it right to the roof of the truck and I can listen to Creedence Clearwater Revival while I'm, while I'm, you know, plowing with my 1974 
Ford F-250 that I always wanted, you know, the color I wanted and everything. It's got, it's got it all. So uh, it depends what you want. Um, this year, this, this coming year, I'm putting up a wind turbine because I want to. I've always wanted to, and I'm going to. I actually helped a guy put one on one time <clears throat> when I was back in Montana. And after I had assembled it and done all the welding and stuff, never saw the guy again. So I never got to sit out there and watch that thing turn and watch the little meter making electricity. Never got to do that. But uh, I want to, and I'm going to, and I'm, I'm working on the, uh, the tower for it. I've already started working on it. So I'm really looking forward to that. And, and other things. I mean, we spend a lot of time on our garden. And when I sit down with a, a plate full of food that's come out of our garden and it nourishes my body <clears throat> and it's fun to eat, it tastes good. Plus me knowing that you know, that is the essence of life is food. I mean, a lot of you guys listening here have been to war-torn countries and you know that you can have gold, but you can't eat gold. But if you can grow food, you're, you're able to survive. And there's something, it does something in the, in the front of your mind. It, it's like a euphoric feeling that, wow, we, I grew this, you know. I, I was in, you know, several meals here, well, most meals here, it's like everything we're eating we produced and uh, embracing your food. It's a, it's a, it's a big deal. I mean, that's one of the things that Jill preaches a lot to people who have health issues is it's generally their health sh issues are environmentally related. And really the, the environment we're talking is what they're stuffing down their throat is making them sick. Um, so there's some rant, but the Hippocratic Oath is the oath that uh, doctors take. They, they, they pledge to do no, no harm. And they, it, right in the oath, it says, let thy, thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. Is that how it goes? Hi Hippocrates said it. It's not in the, the Hippocratic Oath. Oath. Okay. Hippocratic, right? Yeah. Let your food be your medicine and your medicine, your medicine be your food, right? So... That's where your health comes from. And we we know from the Weston A. Price Foundation that mostly everything has to do with your gut. Most of your health um, issues come from gut issues. And that can be straightened out with food, good food. Um, the food that's in the stores right now, it's it, we cannot trust it anymore. You know, trustworthiness has gone out the, the window a long time ago with industrial ag. But there we go. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'm going to answer a okay. follow-up question for Joshua. And then I'll send you back to Brittany's other question, which was a really good one about guilt. Um, Joshua had asked about ashwagandha and then wondered if he would have to wait or get the benefit of taking it right away. And you, he had it in a liquid form i've seen a bunch of those and taken some of them and they do taste really interesting and funky i should you might notice something right away you might <clears throat> not um regular use as your body gets used to relaxing and adapting is helpful um so keep taking it uh, sometimes with those liquids, it helps you just slam it and then chase it with water or tea or whatever. Um, but the thing I wanted to add with that is that it, there's a lot of looking for, well, this is good for me. This is a panacea for whatever it is I've got. Oh, if I just find the right diet for whatever. Baldness. It'll, yeah, baldness. <laughs> You know, my hair's all going to grow back. And ashwagandha is just part of a healthy lifestyle, which includes uh, eating food, 
that's relaxing to your body. For example, salads are great this time of year. It's really hard for your body to digest because they're rough and cold. And what your body would really like is warm and soft. Think the opposite of what's going on outside. So salads are much better in the spring when the fresh greens are coming out and your body wants that fiber so you can move the sludge of winter on through and out. Your body also, the ashwagandha will help with anxiety and relaxing, especially if you're making sure that your evening is relaxing. It's part of a whole lifestyle. So that's, uh, ashwagandha is just part of all the habits that I teach in my Abundant Living course because there's no perfect <clears throat> cure out there. It's all complementary, and how you live has as much to do with your health as what you eat. If all you do is try and eat healthy, it'll be great, but it's not going to do everything that you are hoping. So it's a whole lifestyle thing, Joshua. Make sure you chill through the evening. Get off screens before you go to bed, even though here we are. But take some time to just sit quietly and relax before you go to bed. And you'll find that if you drink your ashwagandha, then everything will work together and you'll feel a lot better. You know, I can attest to that because um, in my earlier life, I was a swing shift worker. <clears throat> And uh, I got used to that, you know, so I've had a lot of hard time getting, I've had a hard time going to bed at the time that I should, but there is an optimum time for sleep and, and all we have to do is watch the animals and we're supposed to be doing the same thing, but the animals don't have electric lights and they don't have TVs and they don't have books and all that stuff and they don't have nightlife and movies and all that stuff like we do. Um, I, I can feel if I have a good night's sleep when I'm up in the morning, it's actually like, I can think, you know, I th cool things come to my mind. Whoa, this is great. Um, but if I don't have a good night's sleep, a lot of times I'm just kind of, just kind of going about it and taking it as it comes, which is not good. We went skiing yesterday, got home at nine o'clock uh got home i was hungry and you're not supposed to eat at night but i like oh i gotta have something to eat and i kind of like watching what's going on in the world you know and i started watching that and i had something to eat and oh by the way on the way home from skiing and i needed something to drink so we had a thermos of coffee and i slammed a cup of coffee big mistake anymore i can't do it anymore so Bedtime last night, 10.30, I'm just laying in bed. So I have to be very careful at this stage of the game. And once you go down this road of health, you you got to stay with it because um, it can disrupt things that I never thought would be disrupted. And I'm learning this all from Jill and her abundant living, you know, Ayurvedic practitioner type stuff. And very good. I think you should... Uh, I, I personally endorse it. I think you should all take a look at it and, uh, you know, share with your friends because uh, if when you have health, then you can do these other things too. But I think that your health has to be there first. So it's sort of like the farm is an extension of our bodies. If the farm's unhealthy, the soil's unhealthy, um, if our process is unhealthy, you know, and we're not going to have the success that we want. So uh, there you go. My little plug for Jill. <laughs> She's helped me out quite a bit. And now we, we come out of the military. We have the best insurance that there is. But we really don't utilize that unless we got a broken bone or a deep cut. And even then, the last time we went there to have a deep cut... <laughs> The wait in line was too long and we just went to Walgreens and get and bought what we needed, you know, and I probably would have done that on my own self, but it was Jill. And I thought, no, I want to have a doctor fix her up, but we came home and did it ourselves. Yeah. And it turned out better. Um, Lenny wondered 
when I teach, and I just started a 14-week course. There you go. If you still are interested, talk to me. Get hold of me either on my course or message me through Baker's Green Acres. It's fine. And we can do that. If you want more information, too, just to poke around. Um, in the website's AbundantLivingSolutions.com, and I have a Abundant Living YouTube channel. So you can get more there. Yeah. I think as, as life goes on here, um, I will be the guy that mows the lawns and uh, she will be the one that's, uh, that's really running the show because that is where it's at. I mean, when people start figuring out that their process for their body and the food that they put in it is paramount in their health, that's when you need a farm. Um, we, in a lot of ways, we put the farm, we put the cart before the horse. We just wanted the farm because we wanted the process. And, you know, the military is a, a, a very unique organization. And you start to be able to see people, uh, functional people and unfunctional people. And then you try to figure out, well, what makes this guy functional and this guy unfunctional? And in my later days in the military, I, I was had to figure that out, uh, people that came to work for me. And what I saw was farm kids were by far the most adaptable. I mean, you could abuse them and they keep coming back. They just get a grin on their face and work harder. You know, they were the, they were the kids that you wanted to be like. They were the ones that we all wanted. And you could usually detect that when you shook hands with them. And by then, I was actually farming. I was, I was kind of, uh, had my little farm out in Montana, and I thought I was a big farmer, right? <laughs> so it's, it's worth looking into, and I think I'm going to promote that even more, you know, because that, that's really the, that's what you need the most. I mean, here I am going to be 60, and I'm looking forward to 60 to 70. I thought it was all over by then, but everything works. And now I have a, a saner head than I did when I was younger. <laughs> All right. I'm going to skip over Brittany and Joe a minute and go to a question Mike had because it might be pressing. He had a sheep that just had three babies a few hours ago. Should he bottle feed one or let them all be? Three, three lambs. If, if Mike, if you were here, I'd say, what even brought that, that the thought of doing that into your mind? Have two of them already suckled and one hasn't? And if that, and you said yes to that, I'd say, well, was the third one the last one out? And if the third one was the last one out, I'd let it go. Now, when they come out, they're coming out with enough food in them for 24 hours. So don't think that the thing's going to um, starve to death. You know, you're going to want to be looking at that tomorrow morning, you know, but just make sure that plenty of bedding. Um, now, before you go to bed tonight, go out and see what's going on. If two of them are up close to mom and the third one's over in the corner, bring it in the house and then you're going to want to bottle feed it. And to bottle feed it, uh, you're going to want to take milk off of the mom, which could be tricky, but that's where the colostrum is. And, and that baby, if it's going to survive, is going to need the colostrum. So, and if that doesn't, if that doesn't answer your question and this is pressing, ring my phone. I think you have my phone number. Vinny? Probably. Mike? If you don't, send me a message and I'll give it to you. <laughs> but I think that's it. I th generally, that's the way it goes. And, you know, this time next year, you'll be kind of, eh, it's not such a big. We had goats for a lot of years, and we've seen all kinds of crazy things that goats will do. And sheep are kind of like them. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, Brittany's question about gilts. What's a sign that a gilt is pregnant? I have one the teats that are hanging low. Okay, first of all, a gilt is a female pig. And she would be a gilt until 
she pharaohs, which until she gives birth. As soon as she's pharaohed, she becomes a sow. Okay, so the, the terminology is good to know. All right, so she's got a guilt. So if she's, Brittany's calling it a guilt, I'm going to assume that it is not a sow. And so if her udders are hanging uh, and she's a first timer, then she's, she's getting, she could be getting close. When you have observed it a lot, I can look at a pig and she's not even bagging up is what they call it, bagging up. Um, and I can tell there's a little line that goes down the side. And if you can see a bump in it, then she's got it. It's that line. And we've noticed this for years. I never read about it or anything. I've just noticed it. And I, I know that that pig's going to go. And I can even see it through a hairy pig, believe it or not. Um, when you can go up to her and you can pull on her uh, teat and you can get milk out of it. I mean, a pretty good squirt. It'll be kind of yellowy. Then she's within 24 hours of going. And depending on where you live, I mean, if you live in the north like we do now, just make sure she's got a lot of bedding and, uh, you know, let her take care of it. Uh, depends what kind of pig it is, too. This is another reason why, you know, I'm a Mangalitsa guy because we've had pigs flop down in the middle of nowhere and give birth to pigs and just do very well at it. I, I don't help them very much. I really don't help them very much. I use them for photo ops mostly. <laughs> but Mike did good. Mike had, oh, there was a crowd of them. It's probably 14 of them. Uh, Mike's got red wattles. This is Mike Finn. And he had a nice big straw bed and she flopped down right in the middle of it and did her thing. And those, those pigs were nice. Mike, if I lived near you, I would be buying some of those. <laughs> they were nice. Red Waddle's another nice pig, I think. Yeah. I think I think that's probably my... Well, one time we did a, a butchering class out in uh, Ohio at uh, Eric Cronister's place. And we did a Mangalitsa a red wattle, and then a farm pig, wasn't it? Yeah, it was two, just, two white farm just pigs. Just white, kind of like the one we did up at Randy's. And, uh, you know, the mangalitsa and the red wattle, side by side, oh, they looked really good. The farm pigs, though, it was like, get these things out of here. They stunk, and they just just didn't look yeah. good. All raised the same. Yeah, all, all raised the, the same, same age. Same grub. It was just stuff. strictly breed of pig. Yeah, breed of pig is is huge. The two things that that come into play is the breed, and then the environment that they're in. So we've seen where Mangalitsa pigs have been put in CAFOs in a concentrated animal feeding operation, and fed corn and soy, and they're still better than the the regular pigs. But I wouldn't recommend doing it. You know, we don't recommend corn and soy unless it's corn on the cob, you know, it's just, it's just not good for, for raising pigs. I mean, the way we do it and the product that we're looking to get, I'll put it that way. Yeah. Uh, Brittany said that this is a first time mom. Yeah. So and <laughs> you say pulling teat, like it's an easy thing. <laughs> and hers are mangalitsa. Oh, so they're, yeah. <laughs> Most mangalitsas are not very friendly like that. Yeah. So when she's flopped over and she goes into her trance, you know, they go into kind of a trance when they're going to uh, feral. Well, by then you're going to know anyway. So <laughs> right. but she, I, I would just, she might also look like she swallowed a basketball. Yeah. She's, she should just be a little bit a bigger. A little poochy there. Yeah. And patience. And every time you go through this process, Brittany, there's going to be more data that you take in and then the next time it happens your view of it your perspective of it will be different and you'll take in different data the next time so by the time you've done it i don't know i, I think i've probably done it over a hundred times now um there's still things that i see 
that I wasn't looking for before that didn't interest me before. I think I just wanted, you know, you have this tendency to be scared that you're going to go out there and find dead pigs or that she's going to lay on some of them or she's going to bite them or thing. And that happens. You know what? That's why they have a big litter. Uh, I got a litter that happened out here. One of my first timers, she had five, only five and only two made it, but they're nice. Nice big pigs, nice big babies. Okay. Um, Are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, and I didn't big write down crowd this tonight. Was, did you get your hay rake fixed? No, but I know what I'm going to do. There's a machine shop in Cadillac that has a heat treating process and a welding um, process, and they can put that shaft together for me. When it was made, they machined a journal, and this thing was probably made in like 1920. They machined a journal into the into the axle and that's where it broke on the journal so it was a grease journal it was so you can put grease in in so i don't need that so uh, we're gonna fill that in with with steel and uh and re and machine it down so i'll have it fixed <laughs> joe brown speaking of biochar do you have any input on a biochar trench in the ground versus a retort? Yeah. Um, either way, you're gonna come out with a product that's gonna be beneficial to your ground and to your your animals if you're going to use it in your animal feeds and i why wouldn't you joe brown raises mangalitsas so um if you make biochar pigs will eat it they really like it and then they inoculate it when it goes through their system and they deposit it out the back and pasture pigs is all about building fertility of soil so it, why wouldn't you do it is just you don't have time to do it or you don't want to do it but you should if your priority is, is fertility and healthier animals. So biochar, what biochar is, is uh, charcoal that's made in an oxygen depleted environment. That's pretty important that it's oxygen depleted. And there's several different ways that you can build machinery to do that. They call them retorts or gasifiers. Um, but what Joe's talking about is digging a trench you put a bunch of wood down in that trench, just scrap wood. I wouldn't be using any railroad ties or anything. And then you burn it, get it going, and then you put dirt over it. So it continues to burn, but it doesn't consume. Uh, I've never done that. <laughs> the problem I would have with that and why I wouldn't do it is because you might dig that up and there's nothing there. <laughs> so how do you, how do you limit the amount of oxygen getting to it? I suppose you'd, it'd be, you know, if your grandparents passed it on down to you, they would be giving you those, those pieces of the puzzle, but I wouldn't know what to tell you. I saw some guys that did biochar at a music festival that I was at in the fall and they had a 275 gallon oil drum. You know, they're the, the oval oil, oil drums, they had it cut off in half and they filled it with wood, they're burning it. And as it's burning, they're putting more wood in constantly, more wood in constantly. And they got it to a point and then they quenched it and it made some really nice charcoal. Uh, the problem with that is you gotta be there and you gotta be tending that. If you walked away from that, there would be nothing but ash left. Um, what the way our retort works is when there's no more distillates in the wood, when there's absolutely nothing left in that wood except carbon, there's no more fuel and there's no, so then there's no more heat and it just turns off. It just goes out. So I can load it, light it, go to bed the next morning I have biochar. 
and it's it's hands off. It 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 tends itself. So you put all this effort into the wood that you're you're going to load in it, and you come out in the morning and there's nothing there. You all you did was just burn off a bunch of wood. That would be a bad thing. I got a story too. When I built my first retort, you can find them online. They're called 5530s, all right? You use a 55-gallon drum, oil drum, and a 30-gallon oil drum. You can find the 30-gallon oil drums in, like, lubrication shops. I mean, uh, usually it's like 90-weight gear oil comes in it. They're smaller, and they fit down inside of the 50, and then you you have to cut some of the 30 away and find the plans online. You know, I won't go into it now, but I made my first batch of biochar, stood there and watched it burn. And then I got called for dinner right about the time I was taking it out. I took all this biochar out and it was really neat. If you ever see it, it's kind of it rings, you know, so you can put a two by four in there. It'll be a little smaller and crinkled, but it's still a two by, and it will ring when you hit it against something and it just breaks. It's brittle. It's, it's cool stuff. And I made this and I was real proud of it. I come to the house and I telling everybody at the kitchen table when we're eating, Hey, this is, it worked, you know, and I'll show it to you after dinner and all this stuff. I go back down there where I dumped it out. And I swear, I thought somebody had come and stolen it. Because in a 30-gallon drum, you don't get that much. You get maybe, I don't know, a pile is, you know, as big as like, I don't know, what would be a pile like, I don't know, like this tall maybe and about this big around. It's very light. And we went back there and it was gone. It was gone. There wasn't even meant much ash there. Of course, I had dumped it on the snow and... What happened was there was embers in it and it just burned up. So when you burn biochar, there's very little ash left and there's no smoke. It's all just heat and it, it will burn really good. So you can, um, another story, when I was doing this hearth, I was working in here, so we needed heat. It was the only thing that we had in the house and uh, it was cold. So I brought in a can, filled it with biochar, put a little alcohol on it and lit it off. And it just sat here and cooked. And there was very little smell, a little bit, not, not a lot though. I mean, but it was, it's actually kind of a pleasant smell. It's sort of a, um, a little bit on the sulfury side, you know, but actually kind of pleasant smelling. And it just sits there and makes heat. And it heated up this room enough for us to, to be in here and work and not get worried that we were going to freeze. Anyway, got a lot of stories. Is there another question? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, how do you get the cows to eat biochar? That's the last question. I oh, <clears throat> all animals will eat it except for cows. They won't voluntarily eat it. You have to fool them. You have to mix it in with something. So, you know, if you're going to give them some grain, I mean, if, if they need it um, and you want it in the fields that they're grazing, um, you know, with pigs, you just throw it in there and they'll attack it. Crunch, 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 they'll eat it all. And you can give them a shovel every day, depending on how many pigs. I don't think you can over overfeed them biochar. I, I really don't think you could. Um, I've eaten it and there's no flavor to it. So why they eat it, I'm not sure. It's got strange properties that I guess we don't know what they are. But if you ever came to my house and let's say you didn't know that I was going to be doing an experiment on you, I've actually done this. And I just have a bowl of biochar sitting in the middle of the table. After a while, people will be picking it up, looking at it, smelling it, even tasting it. Like, what's this? Oh, it's just uh, charcoal. And they'll, well, they just don't seem to get satisfied as to what it is until they've held it, put it in their mouth, smelled it, rung it on the table, you know, because you hit it and it kind of rings. 
it's got strange properties to it. I think it's because we're a carbon based unit as well. Um, so chickens will eat it. That's how I discovered it actually that when I first made it, it was probably April, still snow on the ground here that year. And we had chickens started in a clear span building. We had two chicken tractors that we were using for brooders. So there's 10 by 12 and there had to be like 300 in each one. And I threw some biochar into them. Just, I don't know why I did it. I just did it. And they ran around with it, which they'll do that if you throw a, anything in. You could throw a, a penny in there. They'll run around with it, but after a while, they'll all have their, their turn and they'll just leave it alone. But the biochar, they ate it. And so I threw more in. And I gave threw a whole bunch in to see if, see if they get tired of it and leave it alone. No, they ate it all. And then when we were moving them out to the field, uh, my son Joe said, are these two different batches? I know they all came at the same time. One batch was noticeably smaller than the other batch. And the batch that was doing better was the ones that got the biochar. We didn't really know why that worked. Um, I asked a vet friend of mine and he thought it had something to do with um, the coccidiosis that seems to be in them coming from the from the hatchery and uh but since then we have not used amprolium which is cord we have not used it and we have used biochar since then and it's been 10 or 12 years that we've used it and it, now uh coccidiosis here is something that oh if we start seeing that they're poops getting a little bloody put the biochar to it now we're we're getting kind of smart about it we run the biochar through a small grinder and mix it in with their feed preemptively no problem it doesn't cost us anything and the hold time on the corid or the amprolium the the chemical that you give them the medicine from the last time they have it you can't butcher them for two weeks and I'm sure those guys are trying to give you the impression that, oh, nothing wrong here. You can eat this stuff. Um, but they tell you two weeks. Well, what if you should be waiting a month? You know, I don't know. I don't want to feed my kids anything that they say, caution, <laughs> you know, don't butcher this animal. Uh, you know, wait two weeks to butcher this animal since you've treated. And we found that once they, their system was compromised with coccidiosis and we treated them with amprolium, if you wait two weeks, they get it back. So it didn't, didn't work too good. Um, one last question, Brittany, follow up. Do mangalitsas follow the same pattern as other pigs? Three months, three weeks, three days? Yeah, with that, what she's referring to there is the gestation um, time, you know, um, from the time that they are impregnated by the boar, it'll be three months, three weeks, three days, or 114 days. Um, that's their, how long it takes them from the time they're impregnated until the time they go, you know, plus or minus a couple of days. So, uh, a lot of guys that are using artificial insemination, they, they have it really wired. Um, but on the pasture, the way we're doing it, it's we don't need to know when they're going to go because they don't require our, our help. What you want, Brittany, is a situation where you come out in the morning and, oh, we had pigs last night. You, know, you don't want to be up fretting with them all night long. You don't want that. Um, and you want mother pigs that uh, will increase, just instinctively increase their, their chances of having successful litter, litters. So we had a pig one time, she literally would flop down in wet areas and she would be having her babies and they'd be totally muddy. They did okay, but I didn't think it was a good idea. And so we, 
you know, we called her out. So we want ones that are going to build nests. So you see them walking around with big mouthfuls of straw. That's another thing to look for, Brittany. You, you're you going to have to put um, straw out for her, not hay, straw. And when you see her start walking around with big mouthfuls of it, it's she's going to take it from one place and put it someplace else. They feel like they need to do that. And uh, then you know it's coming. She's getting serious then. Was that the question? Well, yep. That was her question? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're, wow, we're over by 15 minutes. That went really quick. Okay. So uh, last I heard, there's 30 tickets left down there. Um, and you can go to the Rogue Food Conference uh, website. And I know my picture's not there. I'm the guy that they picked because somebody's parents uh, needed them to stay home. So I only got picked for this. Um, because they were sick. <laughs> I was the backup. I was the backup. But then they gave me a really good slot. They gave me like the third slot. So I don't know. And it's pretty good sized conference. And uh, I think that it's going to be the beginning of a new era of conferences. Uh, I, I think the days are over where we just go and complain. We have to come up with some solutions. So that's what this is geared towards uh, solutions. And they're definitely there. And you, know, you might be thinking, oh, they'll think of something else. There's ways, there's ways to, and, and legal ways and non-stressful ways and um, just come and hear what people share, um, especially what I want to share about it because I'm, I'm going to have time to think about it and see how I want to line it up. But I think it's going to be a really fun time. I mean, if you have, you have fun here, you'll have fun there. And uh, like I said, they got a pool. So bring your bathing suits. Okay. I think that's it. We'll, um, we'll catch up with you next time. Thanks everybody for coming by. Please like, share, and subscribe. Baker's Green Acres YouTube channel and the Anyone Can Farm Tribe on Facebook. Another one on Facebook that you probably want to look at is Baker's Green Acres Facebook. Um, it's impressive that there's like 33,000 followers. That's pretty impressive. So anyway, we'll see you.